Um, we've never done anything specifically in the, the steampunk genre, so it was, a, it was a new avenue for us to travel. I know you've worked in a number of genres as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, more than a few. <laughs> yeah. Little, almost like I have a bingo card checking them off over here. <laughs> what do you think are, like, the advantages or disadvantages to, you know, the sort of potentially reductive way people put things into, you know, genre cubbyholes? Well, I don't know. I mean, genre cubbyholes are really for people who shelve books more than uh, for people who write books. They just want to know where to put them. Um, my favorite stuff has always been kind of interstitial, the stuff that you could call... I mean, like, the steampunk that I do or, or was doing, we just wrapped up The Clockwork Century uh, this last year. Uh, it kind of slid toward horror. Certainly the first couple of books in particular were, were, were fairly dark. I mean, um, and, you know, a lot of science fiction. I love, like, survival horror and survival science fiction and science fiction horror and kind of all of that fun stuff in the middle. And the way I tend to get packaged... I mean, that's usually a function of Hollywood. I'm sorry, not Hollywood. I've got the TV on in the background because, anyway, sorry. Oh, quite all right. <laughs> I saw quite the sign right. on there and had this moment of, ah, I need to turn that off. No, I came back into my den because my office is right next to my husband's and I didn't want to bother him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yes. Well, we both work from home, so, you know. No, but, I mean, it, it tends to be a function of New York and, um, you know, how they decide they're going to market something. And, and I mean, that can be both good and bad, you know. Some people end up feeling like they're trapped working in a certain genre and they uh, need to pick up a pseudonym or something before they want to try something new. And I've, I've always just kind of done a bunch of different things. So I've kind of been lucky that way. It doesn't surprise people when I hop genres. Right, right. Very I guess. cool. <laughs> I've, I've, I've gotten them accustomed to the idea that the next thing I do may not be so much like the last thing I did. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that's okay. You know, just try and write a book, better book next time or, you know. <laughs> however it goes. Yeah, well, we're certainly glad to, um, I mean, here at Graphic Audio, we do a bunch of genres as well. I mean, you know, I'll, one month I'll be working on a Western, and then it'll be a science fiction. Thomas, mm -hmm. you're working on... Uh, I'm working on The Ultimates now, which is a Marvel, a Marvel uh, oh, yeah. uh, novelization. Right, so, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to jump around from genre to genre is uh, familiar to us, and... Um, it, yeah, and it's always fun because it opens doors for you. Like, you know, you might find a new audience base who, who wouldn't otherwise find you and appreciate your voice. Um, you know, I think that's probably the same for you and for us. You know, the advantage of, of, of you know, scooping up different new audience members through the appeal of what they consider to be a favorite genre of storytelling. And yeah, then sometimes it, they'll follow the other in and out of it. <laughs> Of course, then again, I mean, I have some readers who really like one set of my books and really don't like another set, and uh, sometimes they're very vocal about that. Um, <laughs> how come you can't write, don't write more like these books, or how come you don't do more of these books? And it's like, well, I don't know, you know any number of reasons, but uh, sorry. <laughs> right, exactly. I have fun doing them all, you know, it's like, well, you bought it. <laughs> right. Thanks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, hopefully, obviously you want everyone to enjoy what you put out, you, you, I'm not one of those people who, who likes to say, oh, well, I write for myself. Well, yeah, I write for myself. I, I write things that I would want to read, I think, but, um, and, and I would prefer for, for readers to, to like what I'm doing. But at the same time, you really, you really can't please everyone all the time. And, you know, you kind of get okay with that and, and uh, try something new once in a while. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know people have given you props for writing um, strong leading roles for women. And uh, and I think I recall you saying, like, yeah, you know, it's not, like, just because I'm a female author, I don't feel like I need to write for, like, heroines per se. It's just, you know, these are the stories that come out the way they come out. And I, I have to say, though, for, but for my own part, I, Nanette Savard, and the ladies here at the office are always glad when people write awesome roles for women because, as you can imagine, with the Western genres and the comic books, yeah, they're not as thick on the ground as the great roles for men, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, especially with the historic stuff, with, with the steampunk stuff in particular, um, you kind of get this idea that, that history looks like one kind of person forever. Mm -hmm. And um, the anecdote I tend to use, when I was a kid, I grew up in Texas, more or less. And back then, they made you take Texas history. And I, I don't know if they still do, but that's what they did at the time. And I was in a multi-grade classroom, so I got a hold of one of the older kids' books, and I read it, and I thought it was really, really cool. 
And I went up to my teacher, who, to be clear, was not a Texan. He was a mean old man from New England. Huh. Uh, but I, I was like, hey, you know, this, was, this was really cool. I just have one question. Why weren't there any ladies in Texas? And he, he kind of gave me this really, you know, condescending smile and was like, oh, darling, there were, there were ladies in Texas. They just weren't doing anything very interesting or important. <laughs> and I, was, I was like eight years old, you know. I mean, I, I was going to come at this guy with my angry feminist agenda. I just, I thought, well, you know, if they're not in the history books, they must not have been there. And so when it comes to, to the historical stuff that I did do, the people who were kind of in, in between, who fell between the cracks, the people who you don't always hear about, those are the ones who tend to be the most interesting to me. And a, a buddy of mine says she's going to call the steampunk books my, my widow's trilogy or something like that, because <laughs> I have all these widows in them. It's like, well, I mean, it was the Civil War. <laughs> there were a lot of widows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and their problems were more interesting to me. And, and also, it, it's kind of, it, it, people like to hold up this kind of this archety- archetypal, uh, you know, uh, straight white guy of history. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, but... <sighs> But, but me, the, the kind of privilege that they're talking about was really unevenly applied, even among white men. You know, if, if you were Irish or Italian or, or Catholic or God help you Jewish mm-hmm. or poor or disabled or, I mean, any number of things could have taken you out of, you know, what looks like a, a high perch to history. And so, so I kind of wanted to make my alternate history a place that, that looked like real history where there's lots of different kinds of people. And uh, so that, that was... And, and a lot of them are women because amazingly half of the people in the world tend to be women. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get into statistics here, but so uh, they, they, they tended to be so far, but I, I'd like to think I got some pretty cool guys going on in the universe too. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I know a lot of really great guys, so <laughs> we'll, we'll write them in there too. What the heck? All right. Well, just, you know, I have to give you my personal gratitude for the strong roles for women. Because, <laughs> you know, well, thank you. Thank you. I really like doing them here at graphic audio. So, yeah, so, uh, as I said, we already have your tangle foot out and available. For anyone wishing to get their own copy of Tangle Foot and listen to it in full graphic audio as uh, directed by me and richly designed uh, Mm. sound by Thomas Hogan, you can do so at www.graphicaudio.net. Uh, and uh, and just wet your whistle for the uh, full course meal to come in Bone Shaker. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, Sherry, I wonder if you can clear up a question I had. Um, there sure. was like, y- I know you'll be shocked <laughs> to learn it, but I got like differing information on the internet. Um, oh, really? Uh-huh. I know, I know, shocked, <laughs> shocked. Um, the order of the books, I wasn't sure, do we... I know they each stand alone, and they're all in the same world, and like it's not like one great big story arc necessarily, but if you could say the order best to consume them in, does it go Bone Shaker, Dreadnought, Ganymede, Inexplicables, Fiddlehead, or is Fiddlehead like more in the middle there? Because I was very confused by that. Uh, no. Yeah, Fiddlehead's the last one. It's, it's, it's the, the last one there. Um, okay. I mean, you... I, I guess, it, it, uh, preferably, I suppose, you would read them in the order they're written, but, but they were really concertedly uh, uh, done with the idea that hopefully people could kind of pick up any given one of them and not really be lost. Okay. Uh, there's, there's also a one-off, a novella I did with Subterranean called Clementine that kind of fits right between Bone Shaker and Dreadnought. So you, you, it's, it's that part of the continuum in the sense that you should definitely make sure you get your hands on it. But kind of in general, I mean, the, the most recent one, Fiddlehead, kind of caps off the broad arc, I guess. If, if there is a broad arc to it, it's, um, mm-hmm. I, I hope it is clear in, in Bone Shaker, even, even though <laughs> Pacific Northwest, not a lot of Civil War action, you know. Uh, I, I do hope it's clear that, that there, the world is really at the cusp of what it can withstand. The war is going to end. Mm-hmm. It's been going on for 20 years in this universe. And really the great arc of of, of the series is the ending of the Civil War, and the war does end in Fiddlehead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you find out what happened to a handful of people who you met along the way, and uh, it's it's got more new characters in it than some of the other ones do. So um, so from that angle, I, it's probably easier for new readers. But it really it really does close off kind of everything that's happened right so, uh, previously in the books. So I have a, is are the middle three is the order of the middle three Dreadnought Ganymede Inexplicables? Yep. Okay. Okay. Very good. 
All right. Well, so good, good. Well, uh, listeners, you can tune back in. I'm done talking shop. I'm done. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I'm I'm consuming these one at a time. I am absolutely new to your to your body of work, and it's been um, just a delightful change to immerse myself oh, well, in this you. world and welcome. Cre- you created. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, in preparation. So like I said, we did Tanglefoot already. I was curious. In another interview I found online. You mentioned an institution called Moccasin Bend, and I wondered, mm-hmm. did was that in any part the inspiration for the Waverly Hills Sanitarium in Tanglefoot, or was that not no. one of the things that you drew on that for? No, there is a Waverly Hills Sanitarium. Oh. <laughs> that, yes, I'm afraid so. That's a real place outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, it, it was not built as long ago. It, it wasn't built, I think, until around 1900. Uh, but I, you know, it, it's alternate history, and I say to hell with it. And Absolutely. <laughs> I said that they were, uh, you know, in 1885 or whatever. Um, I guess it would have been more like 1875. It must have been built, but whatever. I thought it'd be fun. But no, it's a real place. It's a real sanitarium, and, and or it was, and uh, it closed. Oh Lord, I don't know when exactly. But the people who own it now have been kind of running it out, basically for ghost hunters. And then you go to tours and all that kind of stuff, throwing huge Halloween parties hmm. all throughout October. Uh, well, well, they've been fundraising to restore the place. I mean, it was falling down. And they finally, uh, I just read actually yesterday, they finally have the funding together. They're, they're going to fully, finally finish the restoration and uh, reopen it as a hotel. Oh, wow. So if you really don't want to get any sleep outside of Louisville, Kentucky, <laughs> you can go stay in one of the most famously haunted uh, sanitariums in the country. Wow. But yeah, no, Waverly Hills is a real place. And, and Moccasin Bend is a real place, too. That one's here in Chattanooga. Wow. And um, it's one of those things where anytime it, it, it turns up in some of my earlier books uh, that aren't related to the, to the clockwork century stuff. And I, I would occasionally get email about how it was just really way too over the top. Because the fact is, Moccasin Bend is uh, the state mental health facility, uh, largely for the criminally insane, Mm -hmm. and it's built on an ancient Indian burial ground. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, (laughs) because why not, I guess. Uh, And it is is reported to be all kinds of fiercely and profusely haunted and and strange and exciting. And every now and again, somebody's like, well, that was just really over the top, that place you made up in Tennessee. And I'm like, well, here's the website, and... (laughs) <laughs> I know a bunch of people who worked there. My dad, I think, did his nursing practicum there back in the 60s. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's a real place. Wow. <laughs> With some very frightening, you know, things that have happened there and and the things that are claimed about what have happened there. And um, So, yeah. But, I mean, like I always say, real history is so much weirder than anything I can make up. Mm-hmm. That I may as well use the real thing when it's you know when it's that good. I, I was doing a Southern Gothic horror novel. I mean, how can I know about Marcus and Bent and not use it? <laughs> right. You you've said a number of times how uh, the research is a big part of uh, your prep work for creating a story, and it's you know an aspect of your uh, process that you really dig and get into and. We definitely uh, relate to that here as well, like both on the side of like we do our due diligence and we look into like what was so at this point in time, what would be historically accurate, what would not be a total anachronism, excuse me, anachronism, and then (laughs) at the end of the day, we're storytellers and we're here to tell stories, so it's like, yeah, at the end of the day, we're going to do what we do with it. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, just just let it go. It's it's not a you know. And as uh, there's a disclaimer, I think it's at the beginning of Dreadnought. I don't remember. It's at the front of one of them because Bone Shaker got me so much email mm. about all of the things I did wrong with history. Oh, and it's like, look, if if you're a huge stickler for historic accuracy, these probably aren't the books for you. Mm. You know, <laughs> I mean, may, maybe you'll be okay. But like by the time you get to the zombies, perhaps. It will occur to you that, that I am not a huge stickler for all of the great particulars. Uh, but but it, it constantly just cracked me up because the mail I would get on Bone Shaker was always to the tune of, you know, well, you used the mm-hmm. market. Mm-hmm. And that market did not open until 1907 or whenever. <laughs> and it just took me right out of the story. And I'm like, really? Really? Like, you yeah. were okay with the zombies and the poison exactly. gas and the walled off bitty. Exactly. But, but boy, you know, I, I put in the market 
That's you know, where you draw the line. Years, Twenty or gotta, thirty years. Everyone's oh, got to yeah. draw a line somewhere, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, apparently. <laughs> and I did a big disclaimer at the end of Bone Shaker too, because it was my my editor's idea. She was like, just do a little write up about some of the real history and you know whatever. And and I did. We even mentioned. Like, I know that, for example, the Smith Tower wasn't built until the twentieth century, and I know that the train station, and you know, and it didn't stop anybody <laughs> from sending me email. <laughs> Trust wow. me. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure Thomas, now, again, I, I've dragged Thomas Hogan, who's the sound engineer and composer uh, for additional music in this series, into the booth with us so he could join the conversation. Mm -hmm. I imagine that you, um, when you were uh, putting together the sound elements for the score and the theme of the series, mm -hmm. uh, were there moments where you had to stay away from one thing or another because of it being, feeling too modern? Um, yeah, that's like one of my big things about it. Um, when you go on YouTube or something like that and you look for what people would consider steampunk type music, um, you kind of get stuff, you know, quite a few different genres um, that don't really necessarily share all that much in common with one another. And uh, some of it is very modern sounding, very industrial, as in when I say industrial, I mean something like um like <laughs> like like skinny puppy or like like legitimate like um industrial music and um to me uh, i understand that maybe like you know what we associate with industrial being rhythmic but um i'm ha having a hard time with the whole synthesized aspect of it that's why the music that i scored the tangle foot with, with it which i do think is a little bit more of a fantastical thing at least at the end of the day i was like this is very much yeah a magical sort of thing and um, you know, there are certain elements I can include, but it's, it's probably not going to be as important as the stuff I do for future stories, which, which unfortunately I'm, I'm not incredibly familiar with yet, um, but usually um, what, what I do is, uh, you know, I compose as I do post. But um, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm going to try as hard as I can to stay away from obviously synthesized mm -hmm. sounds, um, because I just... I don't know, to me that, yeah, especially if something is um, taking place in the past and I understand it's a, you know, fictional story and, you know, it, you know anything can anything can exist. But um, to me, there's just a certain, like you were saying, like uh, anachronistic element to having something like, a, like an obvious synthesizer or some sort of really like cinematic, modern, electrified drum um, stuff going on. But uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, if 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 it seems to make sense in in the in the grander scheme uh, of Bone Shaker and and the following novels, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'll maybe we can incorporate that a little bit. Mm -hmm. It'll certainly make my job a little easier, at least as far as like drones and whatnot. But um, uh, yeah, I, I was um a lot of what I a lot of my ideas came from what Colleen had sort of referred me to, and and she was a fan of of the Sherlock Holmes um. Uh, soundtracks for the films um, that are fairly recent and uh, that was all akin in my opinion to you know p p composers I'm familiar with that you know Mor Morricone especially and um, so that was easy an easy thing to grasp onto mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely going to um, see what I can what new stuff I can do with it yeah I'm looking forward to it I mean people even mm -hmm. if they don't have the hour to commit at this time to listen to like the whole production of Tanglefoot at graphicaudio.net um, I'm pretty sure they can go to the website and hear like just a minute long clip and mm -hmm. that even just gives you like a feel for the composition and the sort of, you know, as you say, sort of fantastical, but yeah. also like, you know, tense with the uh, the feel of horror a little bit. Um, even just, you know, that minute will give you a little taste, a little taste of what's to come. Right. Yeah. So steampunk plus zombies, Sherry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Plus zombies. It's like chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> I know. There's such good tastes. Can I tell you? I have had actor after actor in the studio, and I'm like, okay, great. We're going to record you. You're the, you know, you're the sky pilot, and in Cly, and all right, go. And I walk them through the scenes, and we do the whole thing. I'm like, great. Now I need some zombie noises from you. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> after, after, act, it's awesome. It's so awesome. Like, I gave them five different <laughs> sort of zombie states of being, and that way, like, <laughs> you know, with a dozen plus actors doing various zombie moaning, Thomas can then do do like here's a zombie or a rotter in our case or here's you know a, a small crowd of rotters or here's a whole bevy of on the attack rot you know so like each actor 
he has like the maximum flexibility to make different scenes of zombie rotters and nothing makes the actors happier. I can't tell you. <laughs> like they leave, they're like, Wow, that was that was really great. Like making zombie attack moans. I I don't know. Everyone I, loves zombies, man. <laughs> Everyone loves the undead. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Now, as far as zombies, where did you? Um, I'm not familiar with with the zombies in your book exactly how they came to be, but but in terms of your inspiration for those, what, was it something that I can't really get into like modern takes on zombies too much because I'm a really big George Romero guy, and I just <laughs> I like Dawn of the Dead, I like Day of the Dead, uh, I like Night of the Living Dead, and when you start getting into um, what was that 28 Days Later where they're running at, at running after you at full speed. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm, I can't, I don't, at that Well, point. I mean, zombies, and I actually, weirdly, I had this kid, God bless his heart, I did this, uh, I did a talk at a school, and there was this middle grade kid who, who was, uh, had a very intense interest in zombies, and he had asked everyone a million questions, and nobody would take his zombie questions seriously, so he cornered me while I was on stage, and he had a microphone and asked me all of his zombie questions, and <laughs> That was one that came up, and and what I what I told him, and and I do think this is true. I wasn't like humoring him. Uh, for really, since the dawn of the twentieth century, it, it, when zombies kind of first entered the popular consciousness, they've been a stand-in for whatever society is kind of generally afraid of. Uh, the, the very earliest zombies that made it into pop culture tended to tended to be people of color. They tended to be poor people uh, who were rising up against you know corrupt authority or whatever, or what was perceived as. Uh, and, and by the time you get around to Romero, you've kind of got the atomic age going on. And, and when, what's, what's the thing for you know, day of the dawn of the dead? It's, it's like, oh, well, there's a comet that passed by or an asteroid or something. So there's this idea of, of this unexplained uh, uh, energy from space or that has to do with, with the nuclear or something or another. And, and by the time you get around to things like 28 days later, you have zombies that aren't actually dead anymore. They're sick. Uh, you you have people who are infected; they're contagious. Right. I mean, this is the age of, of bird flu mm -hmm. and and of pandemics and Ebola, and it's it, they really are just another way of talking about what you know the, the things that seem to be a, a global threat. And a really good zombie story is never about the zombies anyway; it's about the people who survive the zombies. Mm. They're 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 pressure cooker, you know, character dynamics, and and the, because the real threats are the zombies, yes, but the real real threats <laughs> are the other people. Uh, once you've kind of stripped everything down, once 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 you're dragged back to the analog, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's way steampunk and zombies kind of go hand in hand so nicely so often. There is this kind of, um, if steampunk has an underpinning philosophy, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it's, since it can be reduced, reuse, and recycle, and re it's a rejection of kind of um, mass-produced culture, the idea that uh, you want something that not everybody else has and something that will last. And especially here in the South, I mean, I'm you know, a bunch of Civil War reenactors and historians who go out and play with guns that are 160 years old that work just fine. <laughs> um, there is this idea that, that when the grid goes down, what still works? You know, well, the analog still works, the old things still work, the things that you can fix with a screwdriver, you know? I mean, like, okay, I'm, I'm talking to you right now from an iPhone. I can see myself from space with this iPhone, but you know, God help me if I drop it in a bathtub, right. I can't fix it. And, <laughs> and if the cell towers go down, it's, it, it's, it's just a brick. There's nothing I can do with it. And I mean, I'm inconsolable if my internet goes down for 10 minutes, you know, yeah. but, but when the grid goes down and, and when, you know, as this technology that's gotten so away from us, we, the vast majority of people who have devices like this or who have cable or you know, fancy TVs or whatever, like, we are so far removed from their actual production and, and manipulation and, and repair that we're, it, we depend on them so much and yet we are helpless in the face of them. And, and I think that things like zombie stories and things like steampunk stories, I, I think that they kind of collide with that very same thing. Like what happens when there's no grid? Mm -hmm. What happens when it goes away? And uh, really, I, I love zombie story. I like Romero too, but I also really liked Twenty Eight Days Later, and I love uh, uh, some of it, Walking Dead and and uh, Zombieland and uh, oh god, the Silent Hill games, which are kind of zombie esque. And yeah. I mean, there are a lot of zombie video games, but um, but because, like I said, when they're good, they're not they're not about the zombies. They're about every they're about everybody else. Right. Uh, the Last of Us was a really good one. She 
So anyway, that's my rant about zombies. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, you know, hopefully uh, everyone here at Graphic Audio is going to get their zombie love on because uh, we've got another series about yeah. to roll out called Necropolis. I know nothing about oh, it. Oh, yeah, but heard of it. Yeah, but uh, we've I, I've, doubled I've down heard on our zombie. It, but I uh, <laughs> yeah, in the world of zombies. So I'll save Excellent. all those moans and groans for uh, Ken Jackson and his series. <laughs> Do it, series. yeah. Um, Reduce, reuse, and recycle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I've, I've been using on loan from Scott McCormick, another esteemed graphic audio director. He brought in some steampunk goggles for me to wear so I could get into it. Oh, okay. And I've been trying, you know, not to, not to have my fellow directors feel like lesser than, but I, I have to say, like, when I get my, my uh, steampunk fashion on, I do feel like, you know, I'm really rolling with it. I'm really in the moment. <laughs> And I'm hoping to establish oh, a precedent, like fun. maybe the directors of the westerns can. Like, I'm I'm hoping to see Terrence Aselford in Chaps yeah. before it's all over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the fun of steampunk stuff. No two steampunks ever arrive at an event wearing exactly the same thing. I mean, it just it doesn't happen. Uh, well, because they like to make their own stuff and they like to upcycle and use vintage things and um, and and that's again, it's it's half the joy and beauty of it. And I, I think one of the really fun things about steampunk dress up in particular, one reason it kind of just really took off all of a sudden a handful of years ago. Um, when you're doing, uh, like, okay, I was a goth. I was a tragic young gotham myself when I was young. And it was usually me and, you know, 10 dudes in somebody's basement. I was usually the only girl, you know. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, but steam and everybody's kind of about the same age, and you know it's all kind of the same demographic. But in steampunk, there's it's a much much broader breakdown. You got a lot of girls, a lot of guys, a lot of people of, of uh, toddlers to elderly people. I have seen at steampunk events, and my husband used to always complain that it's really hard for guys to dress up and do do costuming and, and that kind of thing. It's so much easier for girls. We have so many more options and so forth but he's like you know if you're a guy and you want to dress up like a goth or like a punk or whatever your options are kind of limited but not with steampunk stuff hmm. uh and 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 victorian cut clothing looks so good on so many men's body types right you know tall short heavy broad thin i mean there, there is there's there's something about the tailoring of it that looks so good and, and hipsters have made the waistcoats and the hats cool again <laughs> so right. you know it's actually fairly easy to find and and, and i like to see it it I like, I've got a corset collection and I have an assortment of vintage clothes and accessories and things, so I don't really wear them very often. But, uh, I mean, well, yes, keep, it's easy keep for that me, trunk but, open, but it's also easy for them. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not getting rid of any. <laughs> I know. You're, it's like you're done with the series, but we're just digging into it. I mean, the resurgence, <laughs> Sherry, is going to be huge. So, I mean, I just well, know I you're going to be, so. like, you know, thanks to graphic I got audio. This continuing to dine out on the clockwork century for months and years to come. No, so. I'm, I'm delighted. No, really, <laughs> most, of the stuff, most of the stuff is put away because I work from home. <laughs> and I just, you know, if I get out of my pajamas on a given day, then, then I'm doing good. And also when I travel, I, I, I had a little problem sometimes traveling with steampunk gear and clothes and accessories and things. And the TSA gets curious about your ray guns. You know, they, <laughs> when you've got stuff that's made up of a bunch of watch parts and, and you know, and that goes through the, uh, through the x-ray machine, they, they want to work with you if they want. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Scott Westerfeld, who does uh, Leviathan and Behemoth and, and those, is, is absolutely wonderful and terribly funny. And when he was on tour, he, he, uh, people kept bringing him these presents and these little pocket watches and things. And by the time he was heading home, he had, you know, a couple dozen of them or, or however many in his carry-on and he couldn't make it through any airport anywhere <laughs> because he kept getting stopped and all of his stuff kept getting searched because it looked like a bomb or something. <laughs> and uh, so, so the dress up and travel, I, you know, I've, I've just kind of it put it on the back burner a little bit. Right. It's a lot of fun and you feel fancy and it's cool, but, uh, but maybe not so much when we have to fly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Prudence, prudence is called for. Yeah. So yeah, some yeah. steampunks at the Comic Con. Oh right. Yeah, instead What's, of the mm -hmm. superhero people. Yeah, so I'm. Um, I I was thinking back, like I realized that inadvertently my first brush with steampunk would probably have been the old Wild Wild West series. In syndication, I just want to make that clear <laughs> yeah, yeah, that I'm. Yeah. I wasn't watching it the first time around. <laughs> I don't know what cable channel regurgitates them now, but I saw it on, like, UHF weekend syndication. <laughs> but, you know, to be fair, it was really just to see what 
pants they had Robert Conrad in. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, these, these things happen. <laughs> I think probably my first brush, or that I remember seeing it as, as an aesthetic and, and thinking, ooh, that, uh, was when I was a little kid. Um, my dad took me to Disney World, me and my sister. Uh, I'm, I'm from Florida, kind of grew up around the Gulf Coast and in Texas and Florida. And, and he was still in Florida after my parents divorced. And, and so he would take us to Disney World. And this was back when they still had the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea ride. Right. Now it's like something, now it's Nemo something. I don't know. <laughs> it's Finding Nemo. But back in the day, I, I remember being a little kid walking into the submarine and thinking, this, <laughs> this is what I want. Look at this. Right. All right. of oh, this, this is amazing. And, well, I mean, besides, like I said, I was an old goth and kind of slid into steampunk sideways. There's, there's a long running joke about how steampunk is what happens when goths discover brown. Yeah, and exactly. There's, there is some truth to that, but really I think it, it also has to do with just the aging of, of that particular generation of goths. Because, I mean, when, when you're young and when you're a teenager and you are, are theatrically unhappy, you know, that's cool. I'm 38. I got a nice house and a husband and, you know, and a writing career. I'm not unhappy anymore. Yeah. Um, but the desire to be theatrical doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. And, and I still have an awful lot of black. I'm very lazy. Yeah. <laughs> and everything matches. Um, but, but I think that there's kind of been, and, and especially with, with um, uh, a, a lot of historic reenacting, which has gotten beyond Civil War reenacting in a lot of places, tea rooms and, and, and trains and Regency parties, and, and it, it, it's a little more acceptable for adults to do, I guess, in a broad sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I think that's kind of part of it. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's a lot of fun, though. It, well, it really I is. mean, that's the thing, is the set dressing around steampunk is, like, it's fun. Just like I'm sure, like, the props designers on Wild Wild West had a really good time figuring out, like, the gadgets and the, and the how's he going to get out of this thing with the bomb and the luck and the thing. Yeah, similarly, like it's a new, it's a, it's a, it's a fun new toolbox for Thomas as a sound designer mm-hmm. to work with. Like it's a different world, mm-hmm. it's a different it's steampunk fashion, you yeah. know, different curly cues, different fun bits. Yeah, I recently did the Superman last Superman book we did called It's Superman, and that takes place in the 30s and 40s, and um, everything was very much all the sound effects, and I tried, I, I had the same issue with music, um, tried to use all acoustic type music but um also sound effects and whatnot and you couldn't really um there's a couple characters that you could probably have a little bit of artistic license with but not so much and i think that's what i'm kind of looking forward to with uh, your series is just having the ability to do what i want with it you know within a certain context i mean you know that's fine but i mean kind of like what i did with tanglefoot i mean i i pretty much put all that stuff together and um and I think it gave off the the you know the the sound that that I was looking to do, and and, and um, I think that there's a little bit more um, room to uh, you know show you know be artistic with the sound design and stuff in those type of situations. Yeah, I mean, just as I'm sure is it, it's. Um exciting for you sherry to have things come together and say like all right this is the draft to publish and like boom we're done it's it's like so thrilling to get as a director through the graphic audio process you know you get the adapted script make a pass at it cast it record the actors edit the mm -mm 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 -mm. and then i get the thing back from thomas or whomever has engineered it with the music and the the footsteps and the door closes and the gunfires and all this stuff and it's just your jaw drops. You're like, I'm short of breath listening to it. It makes me so excited because it's like it literally <laughs> comes to life, um, feels like to me. So that's an exciting part. I was just editing some of uh, Angeline's dialogue before we spoke this afternoon. And I have to oh, say, yeah. yeah. So much fun. Oh, good heavens. Yeah. And the actress who played Angeline is just a wonderful, wonderful voice that we love to use as often as possible. Um, but she, you know, like, I have to appreciate, like, they're just, you get the scene, the scene, and you, you work on the scene, and you build the relationship, and then, boom, you get to have that l- lovely turn of dialogue, and I had to jot this down because it made me laugh so much. Angeline's, uh, talking to Zeke about, I guess, doing violence on Rudy? Yeah, I reckon. Possibly. 
Yeah, and and he and he's like, "What? You're gonna you're gonna kill him?" And she's like, "Why not? He's not the first man I'd like to kill down here, but I'm willing to work him onto the list." <laughs> and I just I had to smile and think of you at your at your uh, <laughs> keyboard, you know, like <laughs> turning the phrase. Mad props. Well, Jerry. if you're terribly curious, um, she was actually a real person for what it's worth. Oh, I want to hear more. She she. She, uh, she was a real person, and she lived uh, to a ripe old age and, and stayed. At, allegedly, she haunts the Pike Place, Pike Place Market. She was Chief Seattle's daughter. And um, without spoiling anything in Bone Shaker, uh, one of the things that really happened to Angeline, she had a daughter who um, was, was caught up in what they would call at the time a bad marriage. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a little boy, and one day Angeline was looking after the boy and brought him home and found her daughter hung in the kitchen. And she spent the rest of her life, I mean, she spent decades trying to get justice for what happened to her daughter, and it never happened. Mm. She, she never, nobody would do anything about it. I, I, for one thing, her husband was a white man, and, uh, and she was not white, and there was no proving anything anyway, even though everybody knew Mm. that even if he hadn't killed her, he'd certainly driven her to it. And the closest she came to any kind of anything with that, she did get to keep custody of the little boy. Mm. And she did end up raising him. But uh, if, if, by the time you get through Bone Shaker, you'll understand why that story was actually relevant. But no, she was a real person. She was not, in fact, a cross-dressing ninja, as it turns out. But um, <laughs> that said, well, I don't know. I just I thought it would be fun to kind of, it, she, she worked so hard and so long, and and what agency she did have was, was so limited. It, it was largely limited by the cult of personality surrounding her, because by the time she was older, uh, the Duwamish and, and most of those tribes had left. Puget Sound had left the area, but she stayed, mm. and she was just kind of locally famous sort of sort of deal. But I, I you know, I wanted to give her. Uh, you know, more agency, more of an active role in some of the crazy stuff that happened. And, and it, so, so it's fun. And I found out after the fact, <laughs> Bone Shaker got picked up um, by Scholastic, one of its printings and was distributed. Through, so there's like a Scholastic edition that made it in schools and stuff. So for the first time, I had a lot of young adult readers. Yeah. And it turns out teenage boys love Princess Angeline. <laughs> Very cool. I had no idea. <laughs> I mean, I get I, first time ever I started getting mail from teenage boys and it almost every single one of them loved 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 Princess Angeline which is why when we got around to Inexplicables which centers around three teenage boys basically she's their primary adult point of contact because oh. it just kind of seemed like the, uh, the thing <laughs> but yeah no she, she was a real person and, and um, quite a character by all reports Oh, good. But, you know, I wasn't. Yeah, I, I didn't realize wanted she to, came back. Yeah, I, I was tr- real careful about casting Cly and Rector because I knew they featured more. Yeah, no, Angeline will, in future books. Yeah, Angeline will be back. Awesome. Angeline and and uh, Hujan and um, oh, and and Craig and Haney, he'll be back. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, most everybody in some form or another will 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 be back around. They they pop in and out of it. I mean, like Bone Shaker happens out in Seattle. Uh, Clementine is kind of a Midwestern thing, mm-hmm. uh, but you guys are doing that one. Uh, so Dreadnought is, is a cross-country thing. It starts in Richmond and works its way back over to Seattle. Mm-hmm. And Ganymede is New Orleans, and, but Inexplicables is back in, in Seattle. And, and part of Ganymede is set in Seattle, too, so you get to see a bunch of those people still. And, um, and Yazoo, he'll, he'll be back, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of recycling of these guys. Super cool. Well, I don't, I, you know, it must be impossible to predict uh, since you're a woman whose career began from a two year old proposal found under a dead man's desk and then on to your first publishing. Is that how that? No, I did. That's, that's, that's what happened, more or less. So you were uh, a young writer. You had a, you had a proposal out to, was it Tor? Um, no, uh, it, you know, actually, it wasn't. <laughs> it was another company in the same building. We're gonna, um, we're gonna edit. I, that I part. don't. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, no, it, it worked out fine. Uh, no, technically, my first publishing experience, I was serializing a book on a live journal, just kind of for giggles, and I got picked up by an indie press based uh, near Atlanta, and that went poorly. And we don't speak of it for legal reasons. Um, but I got the rights back to everything. And then, yes, I, I, 
I got this email out of the blue one day and the subject line said, I hope to God you're still checking this email address or something like that. Yeah. And it was, and, and it was this editorial assistant named Liz Gorinsky who had been cleaning out the office of an editor who had died. And I want to say it was of cancer or something like that. I, I don't remember the particulars. This was back in, I don't know, I guess 2002, maybe it's, it's been a while. Um, and, and she had found my proposal with a bunch of other proposals in a box under this person's desk. And, and, uh, she can't throw anything away without looking at it first, but it had been two years and my phone number had changed. I had moved and this was long enough ago. You were still doing everything by mail, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so yeah, but I still had the email address and I had put that on the uh, query. And so I, uh, that turned out to be her, her first acquisition, her first deal. And, and so I was, so we still work together. <laughs> she's, she's also the editor for the steampunk stuff for the clockwork century. And we're doing a project together next year called Godfathering. So I love Liz to death. She's, she's basically amazing. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And what a turn of fate. And we're so grateful that, uh, that, that, did, you know, gave your, um, career as a published author, a real, a real kickstart and off to the races and so forth. It's really good. It did. Yeah. She is the woman. <laughs> All right. And as are you, Sherry. We we are so thrilled <laughs> that we're partnering with you now and, and uh Oh me too. And uh I again thank you for taking the time to speak with us and